city and county level to address sea level rise and flooding? Um, I think what you have to do is look at the broader issue of what's going on in the county right now. We're facing a fiscal we're facing a fiscal crisis, okay, a financial crisis, and it's a dis a direct result of unbalanced, irresponsible, and uninformed development. Uninformed development. And I wish Dick was here because Dick was chairman of the land use board for the past ten years. But what's happening here is we have too much residential, okay, and they use more services than they pay. We don't have enough business. Right? So what's happening in our county right now is all about stealing from Peter to pay Paul, or cutting services, or growing the tax base. And that's what they have to do. And I tell you, this group here, there's a ton of these companies that I would love to have here in St. John's County. We can talk more about them later on. But I definitely believe Sea Rise is one of them. But the question has to be, where's the money going to come from? Right? Okay, next candidate. Sure. Yeah, my name is John C. Gorman. Uh, call me Jack. And uh, I'm a candidate for District 4 in this, this area. And uh, what are we going to do here, Ms. Moderator? Okay, the question that uh, we'd like you to answer is, what do you think are the most important solutions at the city and county level to address sea level rise and flooding? Sea level rise is inevitable. I live exactly directly west from here. Hurricane Matthew got my attention. I lived in a very thick grove of cedar trees. It uh, took about 12 of them out. And then, Ir and then the next one, Irma, was catastrophic. It took almost all my trees out. I had a tree you couldn't put your arms around floated in front of my front door. So it's, it's happening, it's real. And anything that, uh, anybody that wants to be in denial of it, it's, would be amazing to me. And the solutions? The solution is you, you're not going to get the government to help you. I, I just. Oh, okay. one, one more thing. thing. All right. Just let legislation help you by letting permits be easy for people to fix their own homes. Okay. Now, here's a question for both of you candidates. According to current flood IQ data of the St. John's County, sea level rise plus a hurricane category three would cause flooding-related damage in 32,430 homes in this area alone. What can we do to protect these areas? We'd like to go first. Hey, are you going first, since I went to no. uh, that one? Again, make the permitting easy. In other words, if you've got a home, for instance, right here in Milano Beach, uh, you're going to have to fix it yourself. You're not going to sit there and wait for FEMA to fix it. I just feel strongly about that. Um, uh, it's not a popular opinion, though. So after the sea turtles have done their thing, you're going to have to be able to get a permit without, you know, petitioning. You know, uh, some. Uh, you've got to be able to get permits to fix. I it. think the question was, how do you protect these areas? How do you protect the areas? For yeah. instance, like yeah. sheet piling, and that causes permits. But permits to get sheet piling are incredibly difficult to get. So that is it. The permitting to create and ease to be able to fix your own dwelling, to be able to harden it against uh, the uh, elements. And right now, hardening it, for instance, my house, if I, I'm in an environmentally sensitive area, directly west of here, uh, for me to actually put the aircraft, impossible. Okay, that was Yeah, I agree. You know, sheep piling is also building up the, the beaches and sand. Um, but that, that, you're talking about $26 million a year, you know, for the, just for the first initial 46 miles, $9 million a year after that. So again, I come back to where the familiar income come from. There's even a bigger issue. What's going on with the St. John's River, right? The dredging that goes into the St. John's River. That's causing a big problem with salt water going further down. So it all comes down to, hey, I'm probably the only Republican in the world that will say, yes, sea rising is a problem, right? I'm an engineer. I see it. I get it, okay? And there's the solutions are out there, but where is the money going to come from? And again, if we talk about that later on, I what, are, what are the solutions? Building up the beaches, bringing the sand back up from the, out, the oceans, bring up the beaches, have them higher, again, sheet piling, as well as different types of breakwaters, right? But again, I do not know from an engineering perspective what the effect of that will be. 
I would need to see that. But I, I support that 100%. Okay. Then the next question. Florida's municipalities could take a large hit to their property tax revenues in, let's say, 2045 due to the loss of income from flood-prone properties. According to the UCS underwater report, homes at risk of chronic high tide flooding in 2045 currently contribute nearly $350 million in annual property tax revenue in Florida. What will be your plan to mitigate some of these flood risks and or the risk to local budgets? Okay, so back to local budgets. Anybody write this down, www.electmikesjcc.com. You will find 20 pages of analysis of our budget situation in the county. I'm an engineer, I'm an entrepreneur, I built three companies, sold three companies, marketing guy, and today I consult with venture capitalists. My whole gig is to bring next economy companies into this county, right? Along the I-95 corridor, it can be done, right? There's not a problem with that. So, again, for what can be done by 2045, and the issue I hear all the time is all the money we pay here in taxes, and I agree, but look at the demographics of our the, the community of Long Beaches. Right? We have to be very careful about that because we're aging and we're not going to be working for a long time. And everybody west of us is going to be paying our taxes for the next 10 to 20 years. Right? So we have to find an accommodation with everybody in the county because all those young people who are buying those new houses and we know we don't like them all. Okay, we have to be careful of that. Right? You'll be paying our bills. Well, for one, let me tell you a quick story. I'm going to eat up my time doing it. Uh, there's a place called Mandarin, it's in Jacksonville. Um, they used to hunt, when I first came here in 1972, we used to hunt hogs there. It was swampy, low spots, high spots. Uh, then they took the low spots, piled them on top of high spots, built houses, and they're mad because it floods. Well, it floods. I mean, so zoning is going to be a, a very <coughs> important aspect of it. Don't let people, unless they're going to buy the infrastructure, build places that are going to flood, because they're going to flood. That's one zoning. The other thing is, is listen to the engineers. You may be my opponent, but you've got to listen to the engineers, rather than listen to the committees, because some places are going to flood, and they're not going to be fixable. You're going to have to do it yourself, again, with permitting, with the ability to fix your own house. Okay, thank you very much. Next question, what little of local funding would you put towards sea level rise resilience, and how would you fund that? Can you state that again, please? Yep. Sorry. What level of local funding would you put towards sea level rise resilience or mitigation, and then how would you fund? <coughs> you'd, have, you'd have to use common sense for it. The most sensitive areas, for instance, let's say downtown St. Augustine. You know, the Athena restaurant is actually built up. They did that years ago. The people that own that because the restaurant used to flood all the time. It's actually at sea level. And so you're going to have to, of course, uh, redo the seawall. And then you're going to have to fund that. But the rest of it is going to be common sense. Things that are going to flood anyway, you're not going to be able to make it perfect. But you're going to have to make it more waterproof. And you're going to have to try to get you know, and petition the city to help you do that. But not everybody's going to get everything because at the rate it's going, I mean, you should see my place. It's, it's been flooded very heavily, and I don't expect it to be perfect. I'm just going to have to do the best you can. Our, capital our population has gone up 32% since 2010. 184% in building permits and capital outlays are down. $30 million versus 2010. Those capital outlays down $30 million. The priority of what this county is today is fixing those roads, is building the schools. We need two new high schools, $75 million each. To build a four-lane highway here costs $4.5 million. That just gives you an idea of where the money is. I would love, and I've mentioned this before, I cannot help but think there can't be some way of a public-private partnership to make this happen. We'd have to give something away, but what we could get in back, and it might not just be putting more sand on the beach, again, it could be the breakwaters, but I, just as an engineer, am very concerned of what the long-term effect of putting the breakwater up there is, okay? 
there's a lot of ramifications. If you've ever lived in California like I have, you can see what happens to the natural environment when you do that. But we can't simply lift all the houses up, right? Okay, thank you. All right, gentlemen. What is your single most significant personal or professional accomplishment regarding sea level rise, the environment, energy conservation, or sustainability? Well, 20 years ago, I raised my house about five feet over the normal building permit, and I reaped the rewards of that very uh, last year. So that, uh, to me, is a, is a plus. Uh, so it's planning ahead as far as that goes. I mean, we're all going to have to plan ahead. Back in the day. Is that Mike on? Oh. Back in the day. Um, I think that's on now. Oh, it works. Back in the day, I, uh, I helped clean up the Detroit River, which was a mess. You can actually clean fish there. You can eat fish there now. But I'm looking at five different things sitting here. My brother-in-law is a professor of environmental engineering at uh, RPI. Tidewater power generation. Boom. Why can't we do that in our county? Boom. Three different alternatives to seismic testing. Uh, marine fibrosis doesn't cause any damage to the environment, but allows us to check out what is under the water there. Ways to make solar power more profitable, right? Ways to use natural gas, even though it's not as the best fuel possible, but to help clean up in our environment, right? We can save money from every one of these things. And damn it, I would love to have these companies in our county making and manufacturing and researching these projects, right? Thank you. Next question. In what ways is sea level rise related to human impact on the environment? This is the big picture. Oh, I, 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 there's no question. I, I'm not a denier. It is. I mean, you look at all the um, emissions, you know, what's happening, the, the, the rise in temperatures, you know, the melting of the ice caps. It's part of the environment, right? But us as human beings, I mean, sometimes we have to be smart. It's like in Malibu. If you have a wash, it's probably not a smart sense to uh, build a house in the same place at the same time. And if somebody does that, it's a hard time to have the rest of the people in the county, because we have a lot of people in this county who are going to sympathize with you guys building the house on the beach again. All right? It's really hard. They have their priorities there. When you are out there campaigning, you will see this is the least of their priorities. For me, it's very important because it's an environmental issue. It's like I believe, my overall saying is if you cut it down, it's not going to grow back, right? So I believe in that as well. Or contingent wetlands, or contingent, you know, habitational areas. So I don't know if we can go back and forth. It boils down to common sense. As this goes on, we are going to have less and less a bit of, <laughs> I can't say the word, but anyway, the coasts are going to be less habitable. How do you say that? <coughs> anyway, that yes, right. that's good yeah. enough. And so you're going to have to plan ahead, and you're not going to be able to allow uh, the government to help you. And when these huge firms want to use this valuable property, because they think in the next quarter, they don't think in the next 10 years. Think 10 years ahead, not the next quarter. These huge firms will put busloads of lawyers to tell you that they're going to do it and they have the right to do it. And you're going to have to, as legislatures, not allow it. Because you're going to have to think 10 years ahead, not two years ahead, not one year ahead. That's it, because it won't work otherwise. Miami, parts of Miami will be, they're not useful. They're not getting useful now. Okay, thank you. Uh, this next question is going to just one candidate, and uh, I'm going to address this one to Nicholas because I think John's already answered it in another way. How have you or your family seen or adapted to sea level rise in your life, in your lives, or in your community? We purposely, we bought a new house several years ago, we purposely did not buy um, near the intercoastal or near the ocean because it's the new normal. My best friend bought us Eastbury property. I don't know if any of you guys know where it was, down further towards St. Augustine Beach. Um, he bought it two years ago. He's having problems with his contractors. But he has come to the same conclusion that what's happening is this the new reality? 
he's selling his property. He's not going to build there because what he has to build to prevent himself from sea level rise is just too, it's, cost, it's, it's not cost effective. So he's going to sell the property. He's going to take a big loss on it. I just talked to him about it a couple days ago. But this guy was all gung ho, ready to do what he needed to do. Okay. Rules and regulations, yeah, are killing him as well. But all those rules and regulations are in place to protect what he's going to build. And it's just too, it's not cost efficient anymore to build, right? Have you adapted in any particular way yourself, your family? I made sure that when I bought my house, my house was 25 feet above sea level, okay? And I looked at, being the nerd engineer, I looked at what the average rise of sea level is and what the maximum rise of sea level could possibly be in 15 years, which is how long I plan to leave there, and it will not be above 15 feet. So the water will go around me, okay, but it will not go into my house, right? So I made sure it was that high. Okay, thank you. Challenge next one's for you. Hurricanes are a major factor in the state of Florida. The more recent ones have, uh, that have hit Florida have broken a lot of records. As sea levels rise, hurricane storm surges become more extreme and they do more damage, as you know. I need to ask you, what solutions do you believe need to be put in place to ensure the resilience of our communities, knowing this is coming? Again, I go back to the fact that government needs to help us, not hinder us. If you have a house like mine, and you need to put rip wrap around it in some good fashion. You need to be able to do that without going through a permitting, you know, a permitting morass. In other words, the people in Delano Beach here that need to put sheet piling in front of their homes, not at government expense, but their expense, need to be able to do that without going through two and three years of permitting. Should we be looking at dikes to protect the city of St. Augustine, for example? I lived in, uh, or worked rather, in, out of New Orleans. That, the cost is astronomical. You're going to be able to get the seawall higher to be able to get wave action to stop destroying some of the old buildings. But to put in a pumping station for St. Augustine, I don't know. I, I imagine that we're talking a tremendous amount of money. Yeah, I mean, you can always call the Army Corps of Engineers in here. They came up with a lot of solutions. We can cut through five different um, channels into the intercoastal, okay, to channel water that way. We could build the dikes. Look what it did to the Everglades. Oh, they were smart when they did that. They cut the water flow from the Everglades coming from north to south. Thank you, Nicholas. We gotta move on. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's address this one to you. What do you propose to address uh, the root causes of sea level rise generally? What, what, do you do, what do you plan to do? What do you propose be done to address the root causes of sea level rise? Okay. Um, Let's assume you're a president. Oh, if I, <laughs> if I was a president. I mean, that's, that's the big challenge, right? So it's like, how do you reduce emissions? I think it was the dumbest thing for us to do to get out of the global climate you know, court. I think that was just absolutely ridiculous. You know, uh, but the reality is our country runs on energy, right? So we have to really start thinking about we're all alternative forms of energy, but we have to be practical at the same time. I can look at natural gas. I can look at, here, tidal water power generation. Great idea. It has been, okay, a patent since 1969. Nobody's done with it. Generators under the water, turning power. All that stuff costs money. What happens is you can do it all, but you need to make it economically feasible. Damn it, that's what I want to bring those companies here to do so we can sell to everybody else. But until then, okay, we're stuck with fossil fuels. We're stuck in even natural gas. We do not have a port here to bring in the natural gas. And the pipeline doesn't make sense. Thank you. This next one I'm going to adjust to John because I think Nicholas has already answered it. Considering the current and future impacts of sea level rise, what markets might we invest in to promote growth, entrepreneurship, and economic activity, knowing that sea level rise is coming? When I was on the airport board, I was trying to get them to dredge a small barge canal, you know, to do an intermodal situation there. Uh, sea level rise would do nothing but hurt, would help that. Uh, so in other words, rather than sit there and, and fight the idea, you're going to have to be able to use the idea. In other words, where places are going to be temporarily or affected by the higher sea level, you're going to have to be able to use that to your advantage. 
The Barge Canal wouldn't have done that. It, the Korea Marina? Would, what? Korea Marina? No, actually, we cut down 17 acres of upland instead of dredging that canal. Mm -hmm. And that was because the legislature would not allow us to have a waiver or a hearing. Instead of using $6 million to dredge a barge canal, we use $6 million to cut down an island just like I live on. And so it becomes government legislature in common sense. Okay, thank you. Um, these are some local questions coming up here. And, um, Whoever wants to take a whack at it. Okay. Go first. Regarding recent storm events, such as Hurricane Matthew and Irma, what have we, the, that we speak, we, city, the county, academia, government agencies, what have we as a community have done well? And what was not done well could use more information than needs to be addressed for future risks. So in, for Matthew and Irma, what was done well and what wasn't done well? What do we need to change? I'm rather negative about the whole thing. In other words, because of the lack of north-south arteries, you know, the only artery we have uh, is US-1 for north and south egress from a, uh, we are now, and with all these planned urban developments, if you were here during Floyd like I was, it was impossible to get out of here. It is now more impossible to get out of here. So we've done that very poorly. The planned urban developments we have granted are now going to create a population density that is four or five times what it was during Floyd. So we've done that poorly. And the areas that we have done, so I can't be positive about too much of it, to be honest with you. I'm not going to try to rail too positively. And the places that we've, we've allowed planned urban developments to exist or to be built, you can see this huge clear cutting. Clear cutting is not good. And the areas that they're going to build are going to flood because they have no natural drainage. Would you support more bridges across the intercoastal, for example, to help the evacuation? You're going to have to, eventually, <laughs> or you get a ferry boat. You should have seen it during Floyd. It was complete gridlock. Nicholas, your thoughts? Oh, we did a great job of getting money for uh, the hurricanes from the government. $300 million! Where is that $300 million gone? Not to fix anything that happened from the hurricanes. It's to fix the infrastructure that we've been that's spending $30 million less this year than we did eight years ago, right? So, I mean, we did a great job on that, but we haven't done anything to address the issue. And there's even bigger issues, like these new developments, exactly what we were saying. Stupid, simple things, which is continued, contiguous wetlands will stop a lot of it, right? The water can't drain, right? So it, it's just incredible, but there's another idea. I mean, this whole idea of, um, and, I, and just give me a second to explain it, this high water power generation. People don't know how it works, but it literally sits below the level of the water and acts like breakwater. And the turbines spin, and they create energy at the same time. You don't see them. And we stop the waves from coming in. Right? Wow. I'll have to build that here and sell it to everybody else in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Now uh, this one, this one I really like. Many coastal cities are buying out property owners in flood zones. Others are using what are called rolling easements. Um, and I'll explain for our audience if they're not familiar with it. The rolling easement is a regulation or an interest in land in which a property owner's interest in preventing real estate from eroding or being submerged yields to the public or environmental interest in allowing wetlands, beaches, or access along the shore to migrate in land. So what policies do you think we should have for land that is flooded repeatedly? I think Milano all the way up to Ponte Vedra. Right. Um, I'm not sure I totally understand your question. Shall I read it again? Yes, please. Many coastal cities are buying out property owners in flood zones, and others are using what is called rolling easements. What policies do you think we should have for land that is flooded repeatedly? That's a tough one, okay? Because one of the big one of the biggest complaints that you hear west of the intercoastal, there's a lot of people who live over there. We can't get to the beach, okay? There's no beach for us. Oh, there's a lot of access points all along Ponte Vedra Beach, but it's for the rich people. Who already live there, can park their cars there, right? So you're going to hear that on that side, and so by Bringing the easements out further, closer, that even makes less time for them to have the beach. 
So for me, for areas that repeat flood repeatedly, I would just make that off, off limits. We have to be considerate. If we want to spend money on having a better beach, people have to have access. Okay. We're making good time here. Uh, last question on the local questions. It's uh, decades. It's not really local, it's kind of generically large. Decades of plastic pollution uh, have been building up in our oceans and on our beaches. What policy positions are you interested in seeing implemented to deal with this issue? No, there's like the plastic straw. It's not a. I don't think it's a. Um, the expert group. Uh, well, the plastic straw I think is a start. I mean, the oceans are completely polluted with plastics now. I recently took a vessel across the Sargasso Sea, which is in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and there was a huge pool or pile of floating plastic in it. And it's, so it's unbelievable how much impact man has had on this planet, because the plastics don't degrade rapidly. They really don't. So what can you do on a local level? On a local level, uh, a small tax incentive to use biodegradables? I mean, at that level, I can't think of anything to change the tide of human behavior very quickly. Okay. Nicholas? There's something we can do tomorrow that will end all that. And they did it in Michigan. All right. They have a 15 cent deposit on every piece of plastic and cans you buy. When I was growing up, there was junk and garbage all over. People make a business of walking around the highways, picking up plastic bottles, plastic cans. There is no garbage anymore. Because you have to pay for it, and when you bring it back, they have it down to a sign, so you put it in the machine at the grocery store, and it clicks out your receipt, and you get a piece of paper, and it comes back. But longer term, the only way you're gonna change that is working with industry, right? They've gotta feel a p and pressure why not? They can do this now. They can do body, biodegradable plastic bottle. But either they have to lose money, okay, or they have to make money by doing it. So protest and you stop buying that stuff, it hits them in the bottom line. Or is there a benefit for them to make it? How can they make money on it? They can do it today, okay, but there's no incentive to do it. I wish I thought of that. <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, we've got. Um, Five minutes, so I'm going to give each of you um, one minute to just give a last statement, and that breaks the rules. But I, I'm up here, and she's not. <laughs> hey, Chloe. Okay, one minute. Final statement. Would you like to say anything in addition, in addition to what you've said already? We're going to have to address all these issues with common sense. <coughs> we're going to have to try to do it. We're going to have to address all these issues with common sense, and we're going to have to try to do it and try to stop legislation from being legislative action, from being driven by bustles of lawyers. I don't mean to be so trite about it, but it really is true. In other words, where you're going to have to get people together in a nonpartisan basis, you know, basis. So that's why I ran NPA, to get these things pushed through that make sense without having the tribal nature of parties stop the common sense and start with uh, litigation. I asked, I brought some materials here. Everybody, please read it. I actually wrote a letter to people. You know, I don't give out one of those little cards. You know, and I look at it from an engineering and entrepreneurial perspective. I am 100% convinced, and it's apolitical. I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican. You gotta read it. And go to my website. But I am convinced my solution is going to solve our tax problems. But the companies we're going to bring in here, next economy companies, I could tell three our venture capitalists right now, right? Come, how do we build I grow corn and salt water? How do we grow vertical? How do we build vertical farms hydroponically, aeroponically, that we can sell off to India? How can we make a little generator that runs on solar power that just generates one light that we can sell to Africa? All right? Engineering, science, and technology tag together. We get those people in this county. I guarantee you this whole situation will change. 
because they're the thinkers we need. They're the people that will force change across the board, right? Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. John Gorman and uh, Nicholas Dudinsky. Yeah, Dudinsky. Yeah, don't worry. This is, remember, Mike. Okay. Mike. <laughs> Mike. Yeah. Thank you both. Give me uh, a Thank you. Thank you.